what are the barriers to affect safe and effective opioid therapy? The first one is, um, at least in the United States, many patients are afraid of these drugs and want to save them for when the pain gets unbearable. Um, don't want to take them. Patients and families are very fearful of addiction. They think that the use of morphine signals that we think they're about to die or that they're ready to die. They're quite appropriately concerned about side effects because they are inevitable with opioid treatment. And many patients are reluctant to talk about pain because they're afraid that we will be distracted from treating their disease. Um, if they use their short period of time that they have with us to talk about their pain, then we won't focus on the treatment of their cancer or the treatment of their infection or the treatment of their cardiac problems. So they tend to not report fully about pain. Um, and what are the barriers on our side, the clinician side? We are afraid of addicting our patients. There's tremendous knowledge deficits in the, in the states. The vast majority of medical students and residents get little or no training on the safe and effective use of opioids. Um, there's increasing fear about regulatory restrictions and regulatory oversight because of the epidemic of deaths from overdose in the United States. And based on, on the question that, that you offered, a lot of clinicians in the States are afraid that patients are manipulating us for opioids that they either don't really need or shouldn't have. So there's this tendency to see the patient as um, not genuine, not honest. Uh, about their pain and what they need. And, and I think that's universal um, concern among clinicians. So the first, the first thing to remember is pretty simple. It's PQRST in assessing the pain. So this is the mnemonic, find out what causes the pain and what makes it worse. So what things, so for example, if someone is perfectly comfortable sitting in a chair, but the minute they stand or try to walk, they have pain, that's helpful. Um, if they have pain all the time, regardless of what they're doing, that's helpful. And then what things relieve it? Are there certain positions that relieve it? Are there certain times of day when it's better? Um, are there certain things that they do or don't do that make it better or worse? The second element is what is the quality of the pain? Is, and here's where you ask people to describe it. Is it sharp? Is it burning? Is it throbbing? Um, is it like pins and needles? Um, uh, so understanding the character, the quality of pain can help us figure out what kind of pain it is and therefore what kind of treatment would be appropriate. The R is about, does it radiate? So for example, if someone has back pain, does it shoot down their leg? Um, uh, if they have abdominal pain, is it, or chest pain, is it going to their shoulder or their jaw? Um, are there things that happen at the same time that they get the pain? So when they get the pain, are they also short of breath? Or are they also sweating? Or are they also nauseated? Those things are helpful in understanding the source of the pain. Obviously, we want to know severity. That's the zero to 10 scale. If zero is no pain and 10 is the worst imaginable pain, where would you put your pain? Um, and clearly, um, only the patient can answer that question. There's no blood test for this. There's no imaging study to determine severity of pain. Only the patient can tell us. And then last, the T is temporal pattern, and that's similar to provocative or palliative features. What brings it on? What relieves it? Does it come and go? Is there a pattern? Um, in terms of taking a pain assessment, um, particularly if it's, it's the first time you're assessing this person's pain, you wanna know what they've been taking. Have they been taking Tylenol? Have they been taking um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs? Have they been taking opioids? And then you wanna know, is the medicine working? What impact does it have? Does the pain go from a nine to a seven with a, a given dose? How many doses are they in fact using in the day, which may bear no, no relationship to what you originally prescribed? And what consequences um, are they experiencing? What degree of analgesia? What side effects? Um, and 
also really helpful both for us and for the patient is to make clear that the goal is not the elimination of pain. The goal is control of pain to enable function. So for example, and we could use shortness of breath as an example, a person with severe emphysema, oxygen dependent emphysema, is comfortable sitting in a chair, but is so short of breath getting up from the chair and walking that he or she cannot get to the bathroom or cannot get from bed to chair. So for that person, the goal might be sufficient control of shortness of breath to enable transfers or to enable going from um, bed or chair to the bathroom. Um, so really getting the patient to focus on what they can't do that they need to be able to do because of that pain and then focusing the plan for pain management on improving function as opposed to specifically the level of pain. Um, it's helpful to get people to keep a record of their sleep and how it's interrupted, how the pain varies over time and with medications and also to, to get a handle on how much medicine they're actually taking to count uh, the pills that the person is bringing in with them. And then also to talk to them about some of these medicines, acetaminophen and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs don't cause sedation, but opioids do. Um, and that sedation is usually short-lived. That is, people become tolerant to the sedation after 48 to 72 hours. But it's really important for people to understand, for example, that if they're starting new opioids, they should not drive. They should not um, manage heavy equipment um, during the first several days of treatment because their mental status will be affected until they get accustomed to it. The other um, part of the pain assessment has to do with what we call psychosocial issues. So um, there are many people with a strong history of either childhood or adult trauma, whether it's physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, violence during war, um, extremes of poverty that are the context for the pain. And so it's very important to understand what are the cofactors to the pain. The person may have metastatic cancer, but they also um, experienced physical child abuse. And so everything is magnified by that context. Um, so really important to understand um, prior trauma, previous experiences with pain and how it affected them and how they coped. Um, and something about the meaning of the pain to the patient and family. There are many people in the United States who understand the pain as God's punishment for past sins um, or as suffering that, that they need to experience um, to be a good person. So there's a lot of uh, attribution of meaning to the pain uh, that goes well beyond the impact of the disease on the person's body. And again, asking people to say, what do they think the pain means and what do they think it's from will uncover some of those beliefs. And understanding those is really important to trying to help reduce the pain. Um, and then there's the issue of cost. Um, in the United States now, patients are accountable to pay either a deductible or the actual cost of many of the drugs that we prescribe, and they can't afford them, and they either take them very rarely or much less than they're supposed to, or they don't fill the prescription at all because of cost. Um, and it's important to understand that before you prescribe something. And then there's this concept that was coined by Dame Cicely Saunders when she founded the first hospice in London, St. Christopher's. And she talked about total pain. And that has to do with the pain of losing your identity because of the burden of the illness, with the pain of not being able to be a good provider or a good mother or not being able to continue to work the way you did before, um, of the pain of being seen as ill or uh, less, less than healthy and the stigma that's associated with that. 
the fear of death, the fear of suffering, of depression and anxiety. There's so many elements feeding into the experience of pain, not just the physical impact, for example, of a metastatic lesion from cancer. So important to pursue the assessment of pain with that in mind, that the whole person is suffering from a multitude of pressures, not just the bony meds, for example.